damn, let the woman sleep, okay? Just let her sleep. Thank goodness she got all that rest she needed. Hello. It's gross today. It's really gross. I just got back from the grocery store. Do we want to see my haul? Also, rep. Bagu. Um, we got, I know, don't hate me, but boxed pineapple. I saw that TikTok trend of coconut water and pineapple together. Wanted to try that. Also seemed perfect for, you know, the weather, ATM. <laughs> and then I saw that the store carried some new oat milk. Just been like in a big oat milk craze. Like, cut me some slack, okay? Oat milk just like got here as a trend. So let, let me live a little, okay? I saw this one, Lilk Lush Blend with oat, coconut, and quinoa. Very interesting. It's made in the UK. And also, I mean, look at that, it's so cute. Also found a uh, Oakja. This one is produced in Italy. Love our European oat milks. Look at that, aren't they adorable? Okay, my oats and chia seeds finally arrived after like two weeks stuck in customs for some goddamn reason. And I am ready to make my overnight oats. I'll be eating that 24 seven. You, you can bet on that. And of course, what are overnight oats without berries? Just a giant bag of overpriced frozen berries. Don't even, it was like 13 bucks, all of this. The rip off. Ugh, I just feel like groceries in America are just so much more cheaper. I miss it. And I am obsessed with this. It's just yogurt, but it's like mango flavored and there's like little chunks of mango in it. It's just like the perfect yogurt consistency and mango taste. I just love it so much. Yeah, I am insane. I have so many, so many bottled beverages. What am I? Liquid lunch, lots to get through today. We achieved the beginnings of hot girl summer. Finished up my year of rest and relaxation by Otessa Moshveg. Wow. I mean, what hasn't been said about this, right? So, gonna go a little left field. This will make sense, I promise. So I've been watching Seinfeld and I'm on season eight. You know, I've always just watched an episode here and there on like TBS or what is it? And I just never actually like sat down and watched it from like beginning to end. Also, you couldn't do that during like the early 2000s and whenever the show came out in the 80s and 90s because television, we had no streaming. So very difficult to do. But episode one of season eight has this very different tone to it. Well, let me spoil it for you first. So season seven, near the end, George is trying to not get married and his fiance dies. Won't explain how, it's great, it's hilarious. But season eight begins with the funeral. And this funeral is not taken seriously at all. I think it's like joked around between even the parents and then Jerry references Star Trek to like ease the parents and it just becomes like this farce of tragedy or the space where tragedy doesn't exist. And I think that really speaks to that time period, like late 80s into the 90s and early 2000s, this sort of like gaping hole of mass media apathy, where there was much like today, a lot of content, but like content that wasn't speaking to anything really. I think the 80s, like 70s, 80s was like a really regressive time for like sexual frustrations. Probably why you see a lot of B-horror titty movies. And the 90s was just sort of empty. When I was watching a lot of, because now I'm at that point where I am obsessed with Atessa and I'm just watching all the interviews, just everything. Or an author that she brought up quite often was Brett Easton Ellis and American Psycho and sort of 
this, again, apathy. If anything, that novel is truly just about the artificialness and the obsession over artificialness to the point where we care more about that than everything else in the world in that like corporate 90s aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, that word just kept on appearing in my head as, as I was reading my year of rest and relaxation and thinking a lot about the writers that came out of that time period and the work during that time. For example, well, like the first example that comes to mind is The Fuck Up, Arthur Nursarian, published by MTV Books. And yes, MTV put out books for some time, not quite sure if they still do. But just like this, again, sort of this apathy of life, that troubled man-child and navigating New York. And other novels that do come to mind, I guess that work within the same vein of sort of like this apathy born from this very specific type of self-loathing humor. I think of like Douglas Coupland, Chuck Klosterman, and... Chuck Polonik. Not me having to look up how to pronounce that. Chuck Polonik and just all of these writers that sort of existed in this world where humor was dark enough to reach a sense of apathy. And this is where we come to my year of rest and relaxation. Really, I think, catapults us back into that world and aesthetic. I mean, everyone else has, you know, riffed and talked on about this, so I, I will just leave my thoughts there, because, I mean, that ending also, I mean, how else could have it have ended, given that it was set in 2000, but kind of shocking, beautiful, sudden, just everything, and makes sense that the book ends there, given that we move through all of this attempts to sleep. But goddamn, let the woman sleep, okay? Just let her sleep. And thank goodness she got all that rest she needed. Because that that art, that museum scene with the painting, oof, beautifully done. Beautifully done. Loved that. Also thought a lot about John Waters while reading this because her characters, the Moshfegian character is that one person who is trying to become the filthiest person alive, right? Quoting Pink Flamingos. They do so because they need to. And within that need, there's passion, compassion, and a brutal honesty, and just a sort of like, what's the word I'm looking for? Not work ethic, but just like all the ethics involved, given that some of it might not be ethical for Moshfegian characters but just this dire need to become. Reaching that state of becoming is really interesting. Through the body and all of its ugliness, through pharmaceuticals, through the natural state of being, be it sleep, sex, eating, even though it's crackers, just it's, it's beautiful. I mean, you gotta give these characters credit because I think they're just, really, like all of us, just set up in this really exaggerated form. And looking at their extreme uglies, I think, holds up a mirror to how ugly we might be and what we're not admitting. And maybe that's why it just seems so intense. But I mean, reading the reviews for Lapvona, that seems intense. I am so excited to read the rest of Moshfeg's work, and I'm going to be a Moshfeg completionist. After that, I decided to pick up this experimental novel that I found at Skylight Books in LA. I was really drawn to the cover, and this purple, I just love this purple so much, mixed with this like author's profile in black and white. It's just beautifully done. Let me read the blurb for you. Experiment a novel about mirrors, maps, relationships, the ocean, elusive success, and possible happiness. 
through a collage of verbal photographs, overheard dialogue, sexual encounters, found material, and self-identification devices, it charts from past to future the changing currents between two women and two men. Yeah, we talk about feminism, art, the role of art in the 70s and 80s, think New York art scene, all through the lens of a camera. Let me show you the style that it's sort of set in. Black and white, square, a small bare hill, nearly symmetrical, covered with snow and silhouetted against a darker sky with some traces of street horizontal clouds. Across the foreground is a trail of clearly patterned snowshoe prints leading around and behind the hill. A few feet off center to the left, something shows from under the snow, a dark shape with another lighter shape protruding from one side. And it's sort of written in this style as if, if a camera wrote a book, this is what that book would be. You really do get these impressions to the point where the characters aren't even characters, they're caricatures. And the way that the dialogue is written without quotation marks, we get like Sally Rooney vibes, but it's written that way because it's almost as if we're eavesdropping and really not able to connect with these people even though they're talking about these like big social issues that are affecting their lives with uh, themes of identity, even queerism, sex, the role of man versus woman. It's really compelling because we move and act within this camera that's writing the book. It's just so focused in this way where we are trying to see everything, but we can't. The camera eventually understands that it has peripheral zones, just as we do. It looks within a single frame and we can't look outside that frame, even though the camera is trying. And I just think that's kind of beautiful, the way that, I mean, honestly, this was gonna be a DNF because I really couldn't stand it and I just couldn't connect to it in a way it just felt way too technical. And I think that's the issue sometimes with experimental novels. But by the end, the book ends with a description of the ocean. And the book does that very often where it will move in and out of images of the ocean. And I don't know, it kind of just stuck with me. And I've been thinking about this book throughout the day, just the way that a camera works and how much a camera does as, as if it is a person. If you think about it, I mean, we have to give our phones credit for how much energy and heat and focus they take when they shoot a concert for us and hold this memory for us, or when they have pictures of our family or friends and just all of these moments, they, they work so hard for us in terms of collecting memories and they really don't get enough credit, I feel. I'm speaking as if the camera is an actual person. And I think that's what this book tries to achieve through social political ideas, issues, and these caricatures and these images, we really do feel as the camera does. Beautifully done. Uh, by Lucy Lippard. I'm so sorry, did not even mention the author. I See You Mean by Lucy Lippard. In the 70s and 80s, big curator, she essentially set like the feminist art scene in motion or just like tried to make women's work more apparent and seen within the art world. She's like opened shows for Eva Hesse and also Interestingly enough, some of the portions of this book is written where it's almost like a silhouette painting. I'll do, I'll, I'll have images to compare and contrast of what I'm kind of talking about. But a part, like portions of her life are seen in this book, which I think is kind of beautiful. I think, I don't think it's as revolutionary as it is today, but I think it was when it was written, which was in the 70s, early 70s and I think late 90s. Let me fact check that real quick. Written in 1970 and revised in 72 and published in 79. So all of the 70s, essentially. 
And yeah, it's a really good portrait of that time period, of what people were thinking. I think even maybe a reread like far into the future, but I mean, this is definitely something I'll keep. After that, I had a, whatchamacallit, chuljang. What is that in English? Business trip. I had a business trip and had some really long commute hours. So I brought this along, Simple Passion by Annie Erno. Honestly, should have read the original French, given that the language was kind of easy. But translated by Tanya Leslie, who was the first translator of Annie Erno's work and also published a bunch of other stuff. 1991, A Woman's Story being, I guess, her first translated work of Annie Erno. This is, in an almost Nabokovian prose way, attempts to convince us that what she is doing is good. So basis of this recollection, I want to call it, it's not a novel, it's not an essay per se, it's a recollection of the narrator's affair with this foreign worker in Paris. And she is married, she has children, and yeah. But in this sort of like Lolita prose style, through like this beautiful language, we are convinced that what she is doing is good for her. So it works in this interesting way where we are given a bad situation. How is it made good? And can she convince us that it is made good. The language, the voice in this book is very strong, passionate, compassionate. There's just so much eros in this little book and it means so much that the infidelity sort of fades away and you're focused so much on how this romantic fling has created this immense impression on her to the point where it has changed her life. It has changed her worldview, changed her as a person, as if she's coming into an almost, what do you call that when you die and then you rebirth into something else? What is that word? Oh God, that is so terrible, but that. <laughs> I don't know why my brain is so fried today, but that, yeah, and she changes for the better for herself through this terrible thing that she participated in and had full consent of. What do you do with that? When we think of people who cheat, we immediately think they are terrible people. But when that cheating has changed someone, what do you, I mean, who are we to judge, right? Who are we to judge to tell a person how they should feel or how they should act or how they should be, given that they, yeah, have done this terrible thing. Reminds me a lot of like, if your friend tells you they did something toxic and you kind of just support them in a way, it's kind of like that. Yet us as the readers are total strangers to the narrator in this little work. And yeah, it's just beautifully done. Erno has just such this beautiful voice that is really resonant. A little bit of philosophical meanderings. Just there's so much heart. There's so much concentration in heart here. And she does a really wonderful job of trying to say the unsayable. When you are in love and you have so many feelings and you don't know how to express them in words, she attempts to do that here in like this very short work. Beautiful, very beautiful. Definitely going to reread this in the future sometime. I just love works like that, that are like so small, short, but like makes you think a lot and you can always go back and find something new. This is what this feels like. And my first Fitzcarraldo edition book, so excited to pick up more. Yeah, I just love the simplistic text over this like off-white background in this very, very nice blue. I don't think it shows up very well on camera, but beautiful. And now we are reading J.G. Ballard's The Unlimited Dream Company. And gosh, oh golly, this is some wild ride. I, 
I don't even know how to describe it to you, but this man named Blake crashes his stolen aircraft in this t into this town. He saved, but there's just so much going on, like in a single paragraph, just so much happens. And I'm not quite sure how Ballard does it. It's kind of incredible. He's an incredible writer. There's just so much whimsy, terror, absolute nonsense. It's, it's just wild. I really don't know. It's like weirdly sexual. And I mean, he also wrote Crash, so I haven't read that yet, but I, I want to read it before I watch it. Um, the film's done by Cronenberg, makes sense. But yeah, just like really pervy, like gross and interesting ways, like here. So, okay, he meets this guy. I felt, here, I'll read it to you. Sort of give you a taste of what Ballard is like. I felt attracted to him, not by some deviant homosexual urge the crash had jerked loose from my psyche, but by an almost brotherly intimacy with his body, with his thighs and shoulders, arms and buttocks, as if we had shared a bedroom through our childhoods. I was the younger but stronger brother, the yardstick against which Stark would forever measure himself. I could embrace him wherever I choose, force his hands against my bruised ribs to see if he had tried to attack me, test the bite of his mouth. And even in like, yeah, this like, cause he is heterosexual, but like in this like almost, in this like no homo way, it is quite homo and sexual. Yeah, I, oof, I don't know what to make of this right now. It's just wild, absolutely wild. Oh, wait, I love this description if I can quickly find it. So he just has this desire to be in the air and to fly. This doesn't spoil anything, but it, it's about, basically a part of his history. Disowned by my father, I had never been close to him and often fantasized that my real father was one of the early American astronauts and that I had been conceived by semen ripened in outer space, a messianic figure born into my mother's womb from a pregnant universe. I began an erratic and increasingly steep slalom. Rejected would-be mercenary pilot, failed Jesuit novice, unpublished writer of pornography, I spent many excited weekends dialing deserted offices all over London and dictating extraordinary sexual fantasies into their answering machines to be typed out for amazed executives by the unsuspecting unsus secretaries. Yet for all these failures, I had a tenacious faith in myself, a messiah as yet without a message, who would one day assemble a unique identity out of this defective jigsaw. Wild. Almost like Mosh Fegian in a way, without the lunacy. I feel like Mosh Feg's characters exist in some sort of like concrete reality. Not like con like just in like a real world kind of way. Like a ghost world apathy, if that makes any sense. And then I just got this email from Audible for like a free trial. And I was like, wait a minute. I Pretty sure John Waters has an audiobook for his new novel, Wiremouth. So we got it. We got the free audiobook. And please, someone remind me to unsubscribe because it's like one of those automatic payment subscriptions. And it's, I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to pay for it. But yes, we are reading John Waters' Liarmouth, and it is also incredibly wild. I don't know if I can read two wild books side by side, but it's essentially about this woman who steals people's luggages. She's a luggage thief. She goes to airports and steals people's stuff. And she has a boyfriend slash apprentice who also helps her. And his form of payment is that he gets to have sex with her once a year. And yeah, that's the only time he nuts. It's just wild. There was like this tickling party scene and yeah, I will get into that <laughs> later. I already feel like this is a lot to take in. Like all of this, a lot. Why am I doing the most in June as it's ending? last week of June. I am doing the most here, why, why? Yes, that's as far as book updates go. 
Please tell me what you're reading. I always love hearing about new books and I really need to get out of the habit of reading kind of what the mainstream world is reading or just see way too much of it that I actually don't know what other people are reading in their own individual lives and I'm very curious. So please, anyone out there, tell me what you're reading. Would love to hear it. Hi. It's a very gloomy Saturday, but also very warm. It's like high 80s today. I look like an absolute clown with this tie bag. I think I will not wear it around my neck, <laughs> but uh, I think I'll just like wear it over my shoulder, maybe. But this is the fit. Got some white jeans, this nylon shirt to keep us uh, UV protected, but also cool. Topping it off with Sunny's book truck, unreliable narrator here. Yeah, doing brunch and coffee with a friend. <laughs> incredibly wild and we are in the middle of unlimited dream company which is also wild to be wild in two different wild books is wild i just got done with the scene where our narrator turns into a whale liar mouth i just got done with the scene where our narrator just had sex in the airplane lavatory yeah anyway hoping to finish these by the end of the weekend because i believe it's going to rain tomorrow and i just want to be indoors but we got a little package from bagu if y'all know if y'all a bagu stan there was a recent sanrio collab so i had to Pick stuff up. What was that? What was that? Yes, great. Yes, we got the Kuropi bagger bags in the regular and the small, the baby. <laughs> look, they're so adorable. Shall we take a look? Look at that, super cute. Oh, love that little green tag, it says Bagu with a little karaoke. It's so adorable. Ow! So, so cute. Look at that. Adorbs. Also, it's summer, so I decided to pick up the Bagu wine bags because all I want to do is drink white wine with a bit of like Sprite, 7-Up. Although I really shouldn't drink soda. But it's glass bottle season. Yep. Those are my updates. Not very uh, eventful, I'm sorry. But um, I've just been really busy at work. So that has pretty much swamped me over as well as just America being its dumb self again. And yeah, I don't really feel like doing anything. Also, it's just like way too hot to do anything. In Korean summers, I literally don't exist because it's just gross. Like, I can't, I don't sleep well. The sun rises at like 5 a.m. It's just a time where I don't want to exist at all. 
and it's like humid hot. We'll be in the very high 90s with humidity. Tell me, how is that livable at all? Anyway, yes, hopefully I'll have some words on this and Liar Mouth is coming soon. I'll walk us through. Be better! No, that would be too easy.